mal meine Begrüßung auf Deutsch, weil es ist wirklich so, dass mein Englisch nicht so gut ist. Danach muss ich dann meine Sachen, die ich auf Deutsch geschrieben habe, versuchen zu übersetzen. Vielleicht gelingt es, wahrscheinlich sogar. Diejenigen, wenn wir gleich die Texte vorlesen, für die, diejenigen, die es gerne auf Deutsch haben möchten, gibt es da hinten gibt es Kopfhörer, wo die Simultanübersetzung stattfindet, vom Englischen ins Deutsche. Wer das möchte, hat da eine Möglichkeit, sich jetzt die Kopfhörer zu holen. Okay, so we begin. Uh, thank you for coming. From how many how many uh, uh, hours you have to uh, to fly? I think twenty. Uh, thirty five hours for me. Thirty five uh, hours. No, three five. Thirty five. Ah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. That's enough. Huh? And you yeah. also? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is uh, Tina Maketi. This is um, Eleanor Ketten, young writers, and this is Bill Menhir. Old writer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, he's the editor of uh, the short story, in short stories, Ein anderes Land, it's uh, in English, Another Land. Mm -hmm. And um, the short stories you choose, they are, this, uh, these are from 1965 to 2011. Yeah, yeah. And um, why are you not choose um, short stories before? Ah, well, the, the, the original book that uh, this one is based on uh, begins with Catherine Mansfield and uh, goes right through to the present. But uh, the publishers, the German publishers, were very keen to have something that represented the contemporary world of New Zealand writing much more vigorously uh, and richly. And so we decided that we could drop the first half <laughs> of, of, of the New Zealand book, which is called Some Other Country, Uh, in English, uh, and then we could expand the second half. Yeah. So that's what happened. So uh, that means the original is more than the German can read. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if we'd put everything in, it would have been 600 pages long and uh. too heavy to take, take yeah. around, you know. Yeah. yeah. But I think German people are, um, would like to, to read 600 pages because we have so oh, novels, well. they are so big. <laughs> well, we'll have to speak to the publisher very firmly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, you are a writer too? Mm, but poetry, not, not poetry. really fiction. Yeah. Poetry. Yeah. Is poetry um, very um, uh, appreciated in, uh, in New Zealand? Yeah, I think it is. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't have a huge audience, as poetry doesn't have a huge audience anywhere, but New Zealanders seem to be very, very good at it, I think. And we have a poet laureate who is appointed every year by the National Library, so there's an official presence for poetry in the country in that sort of way. Uh, so no, poetry's pretty good. Yeah. I think, I think. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the short stories you, you choose, uh, is it representative for the issues you have in uh, New Zealand? I think it's fairly representative. Uh, these two might have a better sense. Uh, But I, I didn't really choose the stories in terms of what they were about. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's an element of that, but I, I, I think they're chosen more because they're extremely good stories and yeah. you get a range of different attitudes. And uh, some of the stories, as, as you'll have noticed, are quite dark and they, they challenge the whole idea of New Zealand as a tourist paradise. Yeah. Uh, but some of them are quite funny as well, so there's a kind of laconic comedy inside the New Zealand character which sits inside some of these stories too. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but the stories are like this that I want to go to New Zealand uh, despite oh, good. there is not only the tourist things. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> It's great. It's very sympathetic. Yeah. Um, the topics you choose, this is uh, love stories, stories about um, uh, family difficulties, yeah. um, about social problems, mm -hmm. and uh, what I realized is that uh, these stories are written in a very direct way, uh -huh. all the stories. It's yeah. a direct way, there is nothing that is high, hidden, it is really a direct way. I think this is, maybe, I'm, I'm wrong, is this 
a special thing you can say this is for New Zealand um, novels or literature? Oh, maybe. I think, I think we like to think we don't, in, in the English phrase, over egg the pudding, that we don't, we don't do things too extravagantly or too richly, that we speak a little bit quietly and a little bit modestly and straightforwardly and uh, what you see is what you get and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So I suppose the stories match that sense of the New Zealand character yeah. quite well. Mm. And what do you think you can say the character of New Zealand literature is? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty hard, Gabby. <laughs> uh, I, th I think much more various and much more diverse than, than most people think. I think most people look at New Zealand and they say four and a half million people, end of the universe from here, uh, very straightforward kind of country, all blacks playing rugby, uh, and that's lovely mountains, lovely lakes, and that's it. But yeah. I think the character of New Zealand literature really tells us that the country is much more complex and interesting than a scenic photograph. Yeah. 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 Um, short story, the, the history of short stories is uh, very famous in, in New Zealand. You have a tradition. Yeah, we do. And, and that, that, of course, is because of Catherine Mansfield, who was a great short story writer and, and a leader in the yeah. form, but also because New Zealanders still suffer a little bit from what Australians and New Zealanders call cultural cringe. Yeah. Because she became famous outside New Zealand, mm -hmm. she became even more famous inside New Zealand. Yeah, she was in Germany, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, German yeah. absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So on the one hand, you have Catherine Mansfield, and then you have another remarkable short story writer called Frank Sargison, who stayed at home and wrote in the language of the place much more than Catherine Mansfield, mm -hmm. wrote in the language of the young, dispossessed, working class. And they're, they're, they're sort of the mother and father of the form in New Zealand, mm -hmm. Mansfield and Sargison. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So a very long history that we, yeah. we look yeah. back to. I mean, there are great-grandparents now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Dina Marikiti, um, your short story is uh, Skin and Bones, I yeah. if I translate it now <laughs> yes. back to English. And this short story uh, was um, published in 2010. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have already um, published uh, a book with short stories, only yes. short stories. Oh, yes, this once upon that a time this one. in Aotearoa. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And why do you write short stories? Um, oh, well, I actually find short stories um, uh, give me a wonderful freedom just to experiment. Um, and so I've been working on a novel, but I find that I, I kind of play hooky. I kind of um, take time off from the novel to sneak away and write a short story when, just because it gives me more freedom. Um, and, um, yeah, just to... I can start it and I don't know where it's going to go. Sometimes I do, but most of the time I don't and, and just play, play with the language and um, ideas. And uh, the short stories, I think, because of my, of my uh, question, it's, it's, it's selling good. You can earn money with short stories. <laughs> because in Germany, it is the other way around. The only no. publishers say, oh, no, 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 no not short yes, stories. No, no. novel, yes. It's exactly the same. Not. Yeah, it's yeah. exactly the same in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. That, um, that's nice. You've done some short stories. They're very nice. Could you write a novel, please? <laughs> 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 yeah. Because, yeah, it's very nice when short stories are yeah. published. And I think I would love more people to, um, I mean, for it to be financially much more popular. But, um, but yeah, the the... I guess the novels are the things that yeah. sell in the end, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think let us hear the, the, the beginning of okay. the, your short story, sure. um, Skin and Bones. Okay. I had the page. Okay. Um, so Skin and Bones, I've never read it in New Zealand, so um, I always get a little bit embarrassed because there's a little bit of... Uh, it's a little bit rude in places, so um, this is a bit of a world exclusive in, for Frankfurt. Um, Skin and Bones... He was lonely. It's what you'd expect, really, a man in his situation. He was surrounded by the good earth, his plantation, his stock, a nice river in the valley for fishing. He thought he should be happy, fulfilled, but something was missing. It was spring. He went about the place tilling and planting, and from time to time he felt an urge. 
he'd look down and see his own weighty erection and think, what am I supposed to do with this? He worked hard. There's a massive amount of work to do when you first start out on a place. He needed to get everything working in rhythm with everything else. He wanted to be self-sufficient, so he added in fruit trees and feed crops and found he enjoyed the bird life that came to Fossick in his orchards. Despite this, at night the urge all but overcame him. He would thrash about in his bed, the mass of the pulsing thing between his legs making it impossible to lie comfortably. Nothing would relieve it. His own desperate fumblings had little effect. He tried dousing it in cold water, strapping it down with bandages. He prayed for relief. Even though there was no one else around, he felt betrayed by his own neediness. When he stopped for a breather and a drink, he no longer surveyed his land proudly as he wiped the sweat from his brow. He frowned. The bird song no longer reached his ears. He saw that the shed needed painting, the weeds needed pulling, and the trees needed fertilizing. He saw that it was not good. There came a day so hot the earth beneath his fingers was warm to touch. He had watered it in preparation for his seedlings, and now he sat and ate his lunch beside it, running his left hand through the dirt as if it were sand on a beach. He was hard again, as he was almost constantly these days. It occurred to him that it would be pleasant to unsheath his penis in the warm, sunlit air. He looked far around himself. Of course, there was no one there. He hadn't seen any of his brothers since they had fought, had that fight last winter, during which Tafiri destroyed several of his crops and crashed into his house, causing the roof to collapse. Tane, you've got to get him back for that, Tu had goaded. I'll back you up. But he'd rejected Tu's advice, so Tu turned on him as well. The only one he was on speaking terms with at the moment was Rongo, but he lived miles away. His meal finished, he thought, why the heck not, and pulled off his pants. His hand... His left hand was still dirty, but rather than cleaning it, he let it be, finding himself even more aroused by the odour of the earth. He stroked himself, but this still felt like his own hand, so he fell to his knees and began moulding the soil into a pleasing shape so that he could lie against it. At the last moment, he made a hollow deep into the mound he had formed, and no longer thinking rationally at all, he inserted himself there. Well, for a man as inexperienced as Tane, this was a revelation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Your story is about uh, to um, to form a woman yes. by yes. earth. Yes. Yeah. And I th thought, because it is a modern telling, and it's always the past. Of, your his, of the history, the mythos. I do not know the word. In myths, myths. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is this it? week? Yeah. yeah. Myths. Now it's better. Yes. Now it's better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Mythology. Yes. Um, I think this is what you, what you do the, to to put together the modern tellings and the mythos of your of your past. Is it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think I was prompted by a student that I was studying with under Bill actually. Um, and she said, think about mythology that you know, and um, we, we kind of taught each other in, in our workshops sometimes, and um, I remembered these myths that had been very formative um, in my own education, older education, you know, po um, post high school, um, and this particular myth, I'd um, always wondered about, so he forms a woman, and um, I'd always thought, well, who, who was the woman? Because in the myth, it's quite often the man, the male god, being very active and creating this being out of, um, out of the earth. And then he breathes life into her, and that's it. And so even though most of the story is about him doing this, um, it was really about her, who, who would she have been? So um, that was kind of the heart of the story that I finally get to at the end. Um, but... In that original myth, there's a kind of naivety in the God and that he doesn't really know what he's doing. And I really like that because I thought that's what, um, that's what relationships and when you first kind of form a relationship, that's what that's really like. And I just thought if he was a human being and if he had to live today, how would I retell that story with exactly the same things that happened pretty much in the myth but making them have to happen 
as if they had happened today. So yeah. that was yeah. the basic, yeah. But in, in the end, really, I must laugh because when she uh, gets to, to life, he's, she said to him, oh, you are looking like skin and bones. We must have a meal. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, She's, you know, that's the end of the story. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is to make something, uh, to make fun of this a yes. little bit, is it? Well, well, yes, this this idea that she is nothing, and then he creates her, and she's something. No, I think she was always there, and yeah. so she's very she's a very strong being in the end. Yeah, yeah. And so his his forming her is not so much a, just a one sided thing. And when I say that that those were the European versions of Maori myths, so that the oral history had been written down by anthropologists or or whoever came to write them down and had written perhaps uh, the story. I, I don't know what the original oral story would have sounded like when you've got kind of um, European, um, you know, settlers or visitors or whatever writing writing the story in their own kind of maybe with their own background, their own patriarch. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a story in Greek, I think. Mm. Yeah, the mm. mythology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there the woman is very, very. Um, uh, what is she? It's only said, "Oh, I'm." I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I love you like, like this. Yes, the yeah. The other way around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of my my uh, my feeling about how w women, and particularly Maori women, are. Yeah. They're not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. I look at the time, so we have <laughs> we have to to change to you. Okay. Thank you, Elena Ketten. Um, you're. I do not know the title in English. The story. Which is in this oh, book. Oh, it's got two tides. It's got two tides. Two tides, okay. Mm -hmm. And this two tides, it is about a teller, it's a woman teller, mm -hmm. and a man, it is, he's uh, named Craig. Mm -hmm. And they are on the boat of Craig, mm -hmm. they are, they ship on the, on the coast, near the coast, and uh, there is an atmosphere where you do not know what will happen. They talking about murders on another ship, mm -hmm. and uh, he is a man who uh, likes his uh, freedom mm -hmm. in a very special way. Mm -hmm. hmm? Okay, <laughs> more I will not say now. <laughs> Please, you will also uh, read the beginning. I okay, think. Great. Yeah. Yeah. This uh, story was based on a journey I made uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, between the two islands of New Zealand, from uh, just north of Wellington in the North Island to the Marlborough Sounds at the top of the south. And the journey itself is um, like quite, quite remarkably treacherous, just because um, in the, the, the strait between the two islands is uh, almost a kind of a battleground for the two oceans. The Pacific Ocean and the Tasman Sea are um, kind of vying for tidal supremacy in this, um, this, very, this very narrow channel. And it's quite a dangerous journey, and we made it um, on his boat, which is just a little 28-foot um, catch. It was a very, um, a very small boat, so it's quite a, a, it was quite a scary journey, and I ended up turning it into a story and obviously fictionalising a lot of it. Um, so I'll just read the very beginning. The harbour at Mana was a converted mud flat, tightly elbowed and unlovely at any tide but high. I had never been there when the tide was high. The birds were shags mostly. The fish were small. Low tide showed the scabbed height of the yellow mooring posts and the thick curded foam that shivered under the wharves and the dirty bathtub ring on the rocks on the far side of the bay. The marina was tucked into the crook of the elbow, facing back towards the shore. To make the hairpin journey from the shallow flats to open sea was dangerous, and so a central trench had been excavated in the seabed to create a ch channel deep enough for yachts to travel safely on even the ugliest of tides. With his hands, Craig showed me how a yacht's keel delved deep be beneath the surface of the water. The water was blacker when the, tides were, when the tide was low. The boat shrank. The waves left a crust of sea lice and refuse and weed. The tidal margin was shameful somehow, indecent, like the puckered inch of thigh above the garter of a whore. Bad luck to have a woman on board, Craig said as I stepped down into the cockpit and took the tiller in my hand. That's the oldest in the book, but I'll tell you something else. There are grown men on this marina, educated men, who will never leave an anchor on a Friday. Grown men never leave on a Friday. It isn't just a quirk for them. Something runs deeper, and you know the reason why. I did. 
He told me this twice already, the first time at the yacht club with the gale wind thrashing at the door, and the second time in the conical dry space beneath a fir tree on the Plymouth domain, passing the last cigarette back and forth between us with our fingers cupped tight to keep it burning. No, I said, I smiled at him. What's the reason? Vendredi is French, that's Friday, right? That's a word from way back when. And Vendredi means ruled by Venus, right? And Venus is the ruler of women, and women are bad luck at sea. Craig sucked in the wind through his teeth. So, never leave on a Friday. Would you, I said, would you leave on a Friday? Craig thought for a moment. Say if the conditions were perfect, I said. Say if the strait was like glass. Depend on the journey, he said at last. If it was a day trip, I would. But if it was some voyage, some huge beginning, I'd think twice. You don't want to curse on that. Thank you. <laughs> I think that is really a strange beginning uh, to make uh, a boat trip, to say, woman on board, mm, that's, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, the, all the superstitions are, that surround the sailor's life are, are really fascinating to me. And uh, the, the they character... They want to come back. What's that? Well, they want to come back to the woman. But then they leave. <laughs> yes. yeah. After yes. they have left them, yeah. Yes, I actually recently learned the, the Navy toasts for um, all the days of the week. The British Navy has a has a different toast for every every night. And the one for Friday is my favorite. It's um, to our sweethearts and our wives, may they never meet. <laughs> which I quite like. <laughs> yeah. Um this title, Two Tides, um, it is like Ebbe and Flood. Is it related to this? It is the yes. up and down of life? Yes, I think, well, it could have a lot of meanings. Um, uh, New Zealand is a land of two halves. We often talk about it in that way. Um, the North Island and the South Island being poles of a kind. Um, we're um, not, not necessarily antagonistic towards each other, but um, kind of each representing maybe a slightly different aspect of, of New Zealand culture. Um, most of the Māori presence is in the North Island, um, though of course there's also presence in the South. And the South Island has most of the kind of uh, natural, naturally stunning kind of um, uh, sublime parts of the country. And there is this kind of, these, these forces are at work. And because my story, uh, describes a journey between the two islands. I kind of wanted to e explore that, that um, those forces at work in, in New Zealand culture. And also the, the two characters, uh, two people at maybe s in, on kind of similar emotional tides, but at, at, at different points in their lives. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is, for me, you write on one hand very realistic, and the atmosphere you uh, describe and you can ar arise is, um, is, is fantastic. Mm. Is it like this? Is it what yeah. you want? Well, I think that there is an undercurrent of menace in this story. Um, I know that in New Zealand um, film studies, uh, New Zealand film is often described by the phrase the cinema of unease. I mean, there's yeah. this kind yeah. of um, like dark quality that, that, that runs underneath a lot of, a lot, definitely a lot of New Zealand film and I think a lot of New Zealand fiction as well. Um, the murder that is described in this story is a real murder that took place in, that, that, well, that occurred in New Zealand. Um, oh, when was that? I think it was, when were the Hope, Hope and Smart murders? It was in the 90s, I suppose. Um, and it was a, a, a double murder that happened on a boat in the yeah. Marlborough Sounds and um, really kind of gripped the nation's, uh, 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 oh, I'm not really sure, like it, it, um, it was very effective, you know, the, the uh, affecting, I mean, the, the whole country kind of um, was shaken by these murders. Um, the, the people were, were young and um, partying and they, they um, vanished and it's presumed that they were murdered and then dropped into the ocean, though the, um, the, the case was never conclusive. Um, yeah, and so I was kind of like maybe um, drawing drawing on that kind of more more menacing menacing aspect of um, of of the time. Yeah, yeah. for me, your, the the end of your story is open. It is the woman is sleeping during the night, 
and uh, because the anchor is not uh, uh, what is it not deep enough mm -hmm. i think and uh, he she's sleeping and then he she awake in the morning and then there are the uh, the boats of the rich people mm -hmm. around very silent all and he said oh yes maybe may that they all uh, s slept mm -hmm. and uh, the open end for me in the story is i do not know What happened during the woman slept? <laughs> What did he do? I do not know. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. It is impossible. Really, we are in time. Three, three minutes. That's radio. I, <laughs> I told you before. Okay. Uh, but I think we, um, we start a little bit later. When there is a question, please. The microphone is there. So um, I've got a question for Tina. And um, yeah, I just I was just wondering. So what? When did you start writing, or what made you start writing in the first place? Um, ah, <laughs> I I. Th I think I always did a bit, but I, I probably kidded myself. Uh, I didn't really take it seriously. So um, so I kind of think possibly maybe five years ago or so I started taking it seriously and thinking uh, if I'm going to do this, I need to put some good time into it. And my way of doing that as a, um, as a mother of young children at the time was to uh, take courses at um, university and so yeah that's just to give myself deadlines and and also to learn from other people that did this so yeah I guess it was always kind of there in the background but that's that's when I started seriously thank you thanks I have another question for Tina. You mentioned oral traditions, and usually there are a lot of short stories by you which are related to mythology. And do you think that reflecting oral tradition has something to do with your preference of writing short stories rather than novels? Because mm. oral tradition, telling a myth, it's rather a short story. And um, you know that in oral tradition, you always get different versions of the story. So it's more open to experiment and probably it yeah. has an impact on you. Ah, that's a wonderful question, Eva. <laughs> um, and I, I'd never thought of that. So I think there, there, could, be, there could be something in that, definitely. Um, gosh, it's something I actually need to take away with me and think about now. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I don't know if I've got an answer, but I think there, there could be something... And that I mean, even in writing the novel, it's three. The one I'm working on is three narratives, so I can't seem to think. And and I, uh, diversity was very important to me um, with writing those stories. So yeah, you could be right. Okay. When there is no more question, I thank Tina, Elena, Bill for coming. Enjoy uh, the book fair. Enjoy Germany. How long you can stay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. you.